origins of Christianity and how it developed and spread throughout the Roman Empire. To start off, I want to show you guys this uh, chart here showing the number of Christians, estimated numbers, um, at different intervals during the time of the Roman Empire. So obviously in the year zero when Jesus is born, there are no Christians because he is just a baby. <laughs> Um, but over time, they gradually increase, right? So shortly after his death, there's an estimated 1,400 Christians. Uh, again, if you look at the bottom, that's where these numbers are coming from. There's a book about it. Um, and so they kind of, they seem to steadily increase throughout, um, throughout history, right? And then there's the biggest jump is between 300 and 350 AD. All right, so take a minute to look at this chart and think about why do you think the number jumps so high between 300 and 350 AD. What do we know already that will help explain this? Take a minute to think about that. Hopefully you came up with the answer that in the year 325 AD, Emperor Constantine ended the persecution of Christians and converted himself. And during this time period, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. So at this point, a lot more people convert because it's safer to do so. Um, and everyone kind of has to become Christian, right, at a certain point, because that's what the em emperor kind of orders. So this, this does grow, but we do notice there are a substantial amount of Christians uh, even prior to this time, right, during a period of persecution. And just saying that for the first 300 years, Christians are persecuted, yet in those th first 300 years, millions of people convert to the faith, right? So it's an interesting uh, fact. It's important to understand a little bit about the Roman Empire, too, to see kind of putting into context how Christianity developed. So Rome is a very diverse place during this time, right? If we look at a map of Rome, which I'll show you in a minute, it covers a huge range of territory, and there's lots of different religions, philosophies, and, and beliefs kind of in place in the Roman Empire. Um, and so it's not unusual for these new ideas to kind of develop in this empire because the people are used to it. It's been happening before, and it happens after even also. Uh, and for the most part, Roman, the Roman Emperor, uh, the Roman Empire tolerates most religions so long as the people recognize the authority of the Emperor um, and had to honor major Roman gods. Now this is an issue for a certain group of people. What type of people would have an issue with honoring Roman gods? People who are monotheistic are going to have an issue with this because they only believe in one God, right? And so how can they believe in one God to worship and honor other gods? This is not as big of a problem for polytheistic peoples in the Roman Empire, but monotheistic people it is, right? And that includes Jewish and Christian people. And so Christianity actually develops in a region known as Judea, which is in the Middle East, uh, modern-day Israel, uh, near what we talked about earlier in the year with Mesopotamia. And this is the, the traditional homeland of the Jews, right? It's where they originally came from. In the year 63 BC, they're conquered um, by Rome and becomes a province of the Roman Empire. So at this whole period, right, to put some stuff in context, there's this a group of Jews known as Zealots, and these Zealots are the ones who uh, want to rebel and overthrow the Romans to establish their own kingdom again, right? So there's this revolutionary aspect uh, to Judea during the Roman Empire, during the time that Jesus comes to be born and grows up in. Right? And eventually during this time, they also kind of developed this idea of a Messiah, an anointed king who would come and save the Jews. And so Christians recognize Jesus as the Messiah, right? Not as a political ruler, but as a spiritual ruler. And so this kind of this difference in opinion, right, whether they were waiting for a political or a spiritual ruler, is kind of one of the main dividing factors between the Jews and Christians early on. Uh, just to kind of put into some more context, the Zealots, right, they don't go away after Jesus dies, right, they're still around. Uh, and in the year 66, they rebel against the Jews, uh, sorry, against the Romans, um, but they, their, their rebellion fails, and they're temple is destroyed, right? And the temple is the center of Judaism. So when that is destroyed, the focus then starts to shift on prayer and the Torah, the scripture they have. It becomes the main emphasis, not the temple. Just to kind of put this into context a little bit, uh, on the bottom right-hand side of the map, the south uh, eastern portion of the map, you can see Judea, right? Right along the Medi Mediterranean coast there. Uh, that is where this is all happening, right? two of the world's most influential religions actually come from such a small area, right? Judaism and Christianity. 
this map is also kind of helping to put into context the, the graph we saw earlier on um, of how Christianity spreads. So like I said, in the first 325 years before Christianity is really a legal religion, uh, you can see in the darker shaded yellow areas right where it has spread to. So it spreads pretty far for a religion uh, during a time when there are no internet, nothing, no rapid communication, and when they're being persecuted for being Christian. Right? And so it's kind of important to notice that. And then once they become, once Christianity is allowed to be practiced, we can see it really explodes, right? And all the Roman Empire uh, and then territory outside the Roman Empire starts to become part uh, of the Christian tradition. So the main figure in Christianity is Jesus, right? He's born around the year 4 BC. Uh, historians believe that earlier historians were wrong with the timing, and that's why it's 4 BC, not zero. So there's a kind of a discrepancy there between the dates, but somewhere around 4 BC he's born. He is Jewish, right? He practices the Jewish tradition. He goes to synagogue. Uh, he's called rabbi by his followers, right? Um, he practices the Jewish customs. At the age of 30, he preached, starts to begin his own ministry, right? His own his own preaching around the world, uh, around Judea, I should say. Uh, and he has 12 main followers, according to the Gospels, right? And those are what we call the 12 apostles. They believed in the Jewish laws, just like Jesus, but Jesus also begins to teach some new beliefs, beliefs that Jews were not necessarily familiar with beforehand. That's what starts to separate Christians from Jewish people. Some of these new beliefs include that Jesus was taught as uh, preaching that he was a son of God, right? That he was he was God, right? That he was divine, which the Jews were not necessarily expecting a Messiah to be God himself. The preaching of the bodily resurrection that at the end of time that people were raised from the dead, right? Um, that is also a new relief that some Jewish people were not familiar with. And he really, what he does is he condenses Jewish belief, Jewish commandments into one or two main things, right? And it's to love your neighbor with all your heart and to love God, right? That every commandment can be organized under those two, those two parts. And he also starts preaching about the second coming, right? The judgment day when people will be judged, the living and the dead will be judged, right? And those who are saved will spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven and those who are not saved um, in hell. So again, right, another map showing the spread of Christianity. Um, similar to the other map, except this one's using green instead of the yellow color. But what this map also does is it shows us the movements of someone named Paul, right? And St. Paul is one of the most important figures in early Christianity because he takes, he converts to Christianity after persecuting Christians uh, and then becomes very effective at spreading the message and establishing new communities. And so if you look at the map, all these different arrow, different colored arrows shows the journeys he took to spread and establish Christian communities. Uh, and his last journey, right, is the city of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, and that is where St. Paul eventually dies. Christians face persecution um, throughout those first 300 years or so, uh, and like we said earlier, they could refuse to honor the emperor or, or Roman gods with sacrifices, because then that was blasphemy, right? They were worshiping something other than God, and so the Romans did not like them, generally speaking, uh, and, and they persecuted, attacked, killed, tortured them. And so then a new kind of term comes to mind, right? It comes to uh, history, right? And it's the idea of a martyr. And this is someone who dies for their faith, right? So a Christian who was, say, killed in the Colosseum, right? Uh, burnt to death on a cross, right? Those people died for their faith, and they were considered martyrs. That meaning they kind of got almost instant access to heaven, right? The, the dying for their faith gave them salvation. And like we said, it's interesting that during a time of oppression, right, where the risk of death was present, a lot of people continue to convert to Christianity, particularly poor people and oppressed people, because the message of Christ is really to help these people, right? And so these people are most attracted to it, uh, and they start converting in large numbers despite the risk that is involved. Eventually, some of the apostles and, and followers start using Greek philosophy to kind of convert the, the, the more... Uh, wealthier and intelligent people, right? People who are more educated. Uh, and so that also kind of reconciling Greek philosophy with Christian, Christian teaching uh, wins more converts, some more educated converts. Right? And then it was also written in Greek and Latin, which are the languages that kind of everyone in the Roman Empire could speak during this time. It's how they communicate with each other. 
So the message not only was accessible to everybody, but it was also easily spread to everybody. Christianity finally becomes a, a mainstream religion, right, in the year 325, when Constantine ends the persecution of Christians. Faith then spreads even more. People are less afraid to join or, or less afraid to be open about their religion. And as the centuries progress into the Middle Ages, you have the church develops into a well-organized institution. It kind of loses its small community feel and becomes this large entity. Uh, which the development of patriarchs is more important bishops in some of the major cities throughout Rome, uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, and then eventually you have the development of the Pope, right? Kind of the head of all these different patriarchs. Uh, and they become the head of the whole Roman Catholic Church. And that tradition still survives today. It's believed that St. Peter, which is one of the 12 apostles, is the original Pope. Because he was the original Bishop of Rome. Throughout this time, we also have an important figure named St. Augustine, who writes and explains important church teachings. And a lot of his writings influence church teaching and thought up to this day. And just kind of one last kind of visual to end with, just to show you how the church is organized today. You have the Pope at the head, bishops below him who are in charge of running dioceses, like the Diocese of Brooklyn, for example. And within, the, and within each diocese, you have different parishes, right? And each parish has at least one priest uh, and, the, and the church, the community in that, right? And so that's the basic structure of how Christianity and the church develops after it's allowed to become uh, a mainstream religion. So you should go into the harbor now, and there's going to be an assignment related to this, uh, having you think a little bit more about uh, the development of Christianity, some of the main beliefs. Um, so check the harbor for that.